Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will look at optimizing dry matter intake. We look at the total scheme of things, we see the three curves again. We see the dry matter intake curve illustrated here on the yellow curve. The key point to notice, of course, is that it lags behind the milk production curve. Therefore, cows produce more milk before we reach peak dry matter intake. Also, if we look at the new NRC, their tables would indicate that first lactation heifers will peak several weeks later than later lactation cows. Therefore, our strategies are trying to increase dry matter as quickly and as high as we can in early lactation to meet the nutrient requirements for high production and to initiate reproductive performance. Some guidelines on intake. The thumb rule is for each one pound of dry matter intake above maintenance and is used exclusively for milk production should result in two to two and a half pounds of milk. Most farmers won't see this because some of the nutrients will be used for growth, added maintenance costs, and reproductive performance. Another equation from Cornell is from the old NRC. We calculate dry matter intake based on the body weight of the cow, 1.85% of the cow's body weight, plus the amount of milk production she produces on a 4% fat-corrected basis. The second equation listed here is how to calculate 4% fat-corrected milk. So again, we can see the two major factors driving dry matter intake for dairy cows will be their body weight size and the amount of milk that they are producing. Remember, milk production drives dry matter intake based on the BST work and early lactation results. The third equation looks at dry matter intake for dry cows. Roughly 2% is a good thumb rule, except when we get close to calving, and then of course it drops down 10 to 30%. This table simply takes the old NRC equations and generates some guideline numbers to look at. So if I had a group of cows producing 88 pounds of 4% fat corrected milk, that's a very good herd, and they're weighing 1,320 pounds of milk, the target dry matter intake would be about 53 pounds. So you can quickly look at different levels of production and body weights to see the trends and changes. Notice there are some small numbers here for Jersey cows because of extremely high levels of milk production. These are good guidelines, not the new NRC, which we'll discuss in a few minutes, but certainly targets you and I should look at when formulating rations or using computer software programs. Another table illustrates how much dry matter and how quickly it increases after calving. This data is from Al Kurtz's group at Prenum looking at the first five weeks after calving. And two things will quickly jump out at us. First, we look at the first week. Notice dry matter intakes on these healthy cows are modestly low. If we have cows that have metabolic disorders, the numbers are even worse. Second of all, we can see that there is a distinct difference between heifers and mature cows, roughly four to six pounds of dry matter. So again, if we have a fresh cow pen, here are some very useful numbers to see how intake tracks based on days and milk and types of cows in the pen. Now let's take a quick look at the NRC dry matter intake. Very simply, here are the three major items. Number one, they have estimated higher dry matter intakes off a number of equations based on published research. Roughly about four more pounds of dry matter intake. Our feeling is that high producing, well managed, well conditioned cows can meet this higher level of intake, but it is a lot of dry matter intake. Second of all, if we use the NRC model, it adjusts dry matter for days and milk, very similar to what the Prina data we just saw. And finally, we know there is a different adjustment for parity, meaning first lactation cows peak lower and later than older cows. So if we're using the model, we're going to get different numbers than what you might be used to a couple of years earlier. Another way to look at dry matter intake is related to things on the farm. Here are two neat little thumb rules. The first one is that I call a 13-pound tax for Holstein cows. Well, we simply look and say, what is the intake based on after we subtract maintenance requirements out and look at milk production? For roughly in nice round numbers, about the first 13 pounds of dry matter intake each day for Holstein cow goes to maintenance. Therefore, I subtract that 13 pounds from the dry matter intake and what's left over, I multiply by two, assuming all those milk nutrients go entirely to milk production. There's an example. Let's say my group of cows are consuming 53 pounds of dry matter. I subtract the 13, which results in a value of 40. I then assume that all this nutrients goes to milk production, or in other words, I may be using BST. I multiply by two, and the potential is about 80 pounds of milk. In the field, that number usually is five to seven pounds lower because I have growing heifers. I have other costs that cows will utilize and partition nutrients first. But that's why when we use BST, we expect to see about a two pound milk response for the extra dry matter that will occur with BST applications. 
Another fun term is called dairy efficiency. And simply that is taking the milk yield and divide that by the dry matter intake. This is very similar to what hog, beef, and poultry people will do to see how effectively they convert feed into finished product, in this case in milk production. An excellent value is something over 1.5, and I would be concerned if that value drops below 1.3. In the field, we'll see these numbers running all the way from 1.1 to 1.7. Let's look at a quick example. And remember, this milk production is 3.5 fat corrected milk. So if I had 75 pounds of milk with a 3.5 butterfat test, and these cows or this group of cows are eating 50 pounds of dry matter, that value is 1.5, a very good value. Now, if your cows are testing higher than 3.5, a nice thumb rule is to add one pound more milk for every tenth of a pound of milk fat above 3.5. So in this example, if the group of cows are averaging 3.8, instead of using 75, I would use 78 and then do the math. Here's a herd in Wisconsin that shared their data with us, a very large herd, and we can see six different groups of cows or pens of cows which actually had the hard data with it. Let's just look at the first lactation high group. You may want to stop the program at this point and study this chart because there's a lot of information. But we can see in this group of about 200 cows, a first lactation high producing, there are 124 days in milk. This is important because this kind of benchmarks where we think the milk should be, and we can use that for comparison as this herd continues in lactation. They're averaging 79 pounds of milk. The dry matter intake actually recorded is 50 pounds per cow per day. That feed cost coming off their feed charge of $3.15. This was $14 milk. That was a margin of $6.33 income over feed cost. And their dairy efficiency is 1.58. Extremely good number. However, if you saw the heifers, they were losing body weight. So we we're borrowing some of that efficiency from the cows back. And you can see in the next line, we get to the pregnant cows. These cows are now catching up. So we always have to kind of look at the stage of lactation body condition score in previous history before saying, ah, the pregnant group is not high enough and the, and the high group is really smoking. Now you can also look down at the second lactation group and see, again, the high production group of cows have a tremendous efficiency of 1.74. In the good news, they were in excellent body condition. These cows are really converting dry matter into milk yield. So how you and I would use dairy efficiency is to compare differences between production strings, just as we did in the Wisconsin herd. Generally speaking, the high fresh group will have the highest efficiency and it'll drop off in lake lactation because these cows are partitioning cow, partitioning nutrients to weight gain, pregnancy, and other biological functions. We also know that the impact of forage quality is critical. The higher the quality, the greater digestibility, the better this number will look. An extremely high quality forages, you can approach 1.6 and 1.7 values. We know age of cows will make a difference because they have less requirements for growth. We know body condition score, cows losing weight will look better on paper. However, when they're gaining weight, that dairy efficiency drops off. We already know we adjust for higher butterfat tests. And also, if we have rumen acidosis, or if those rumen microbes aren't really lugging and working for us, that will change dairy efficiency. To me, the power of dairy efficiency is to track it on your herd or groups of cows in your herd and see how it changes over times, days in milk, and when other cattle come into the herd. Another powerful slide is to ask, well, if cows aren't eating enough dry matter, why do they stop? This powerful slide from the University of Wisconsin illustrates there are three reasons why cows stop eating. And let's go backwards. Let's look at number three. Number three says that something in the rumen or intestine literally stops the cow from eating. You and I would call that fill factor. And this is closely associated with the fiber levels in the feeding program. That's why we want to keep the NDF levels below 32 to 33 percent of the total ration dry matter and not over 0.9 percent of forage NDF of body weight because of this fill factor. And that's why this low quality forage is really limits milk production. Number two simply says that something the cow absorbs tells her to stop eating. In other words, maybe it's a high level of fat. Maybe there's rumen acidosis going on, an abnormal VFA uh, pattern, or it could also be related to the protein fraction. But the cow's body or, or satiety center simply tells her to stop eating. I call that the M&M effect. If you eat two pounds of M&Ms in one day or in one hour, you too will be told to stop eating M&Ms by your body. The number one reason is perhaps the most critical one we need to focus on because most farmers don't see this one. Nutritionists don't calculate it. And that means something to do with feed perception or the feeding environment. For example, if the bunk is empty, very difficult to eat dry matter intake. 
If it's 90 degrees with 80% humidity, cows aren't very hungry. If cows have poor feet, don't want to walk, they will not walk to the feed bunk that will lay in the free stalls. So certainly we have to remove or look at all three of these reasons why cows stop eating. And so on the right side, it's listed. Number one, non-nutrient factors. Number two, metabolic feedback. And number three, physical fill. As a detective and visit farms, look for all three of these to see if they are bottlenecks in the program. If cows do not eat enough dry matter, Cornell researchers quickly illustrate how the ration needs to change. For example, if my cows are eating 45 pounds of dry matter intake and they go up to 47 and they maintain the same level of milk production, you can see I can cut back on the nutrient density, lower levels of protein, energy, calcium, and phosphorus. Or, for example, summer heat stress hits. My cows were eating 47 pounds of dry matter. Now they drop down to 43. That's a 10% drop. Very common. Notice what you and I would have to do as nutritionists. We'd have to increase the, dry, the nutrient content significantly to try to hold nutrient intake. And that's one reason why cows eat less, or should say produce less, under heat stress conditions. This slide illustrates the importance of dry matter intake. For example, in the green section, we have two diets at 0.78 mcals based on the old NRC system. The, difference, the only difference is that these cows on the second line eat five pounds less dry matter intake. Notice how much less energy they consume about four mcals, and that translates into 11 pounds more milk. Now, let's take another look. Let's say my cows are eating 45 pounds of dry matter. That's the red figures. We can compare that to the previous line, and I've increased the energy density by adding, for example, some added fat. And now the energy concentration is 0.8 megs. Now you look across and you can see, yes, I gained some energy by adding fat, but that difference is about two pounds of milk. So you can quickly see how important the dry matter intake drives. The next line illustrates if I cut energy down 0.76, which may be due to, uh, for a little less, pulling some fat out or taking some grain out of the diet. But look at the bottom line. My cows have a lower energy diet, poor quality feed, summer heat stress, so they eat only 40 pounds of dry matter. You carry across the line and bingo, there we are, 60 pounds of milk. And that's what happens in the Midwest under heavy heat stress. We can lose 20 pounds of dry matter intake because the cows eat a different ration and eat a lot less. Now let's look at the effect of fermented feeds on dry matter intake. We feel the optimal ration moisture for optimum dry matter intake is 45 to 50 percent moisture. The range you should, we'd like to stay in is 40 to 55. Fermented feeds may start to depress dry matter intake once the total ration goes over 50 percent moisture. The newer work out of the new NRC would maybe suggest 55, but at some point the cows can't handle fermented feeds because of the pH effect appears to reduce attachment of the rumen microbes and lower digestibility. If the ration becomes too wet, and if that's 55% moisture, or in very high in fermented feeds, we may need to dilute that down with drier feed ingredients. Dry corn, fuzzy cottonseed, baled hay are all ways to get that job done. Conversely, if the ration is too dry, adding 5 to 7 pounds of water per cow per day and observe and see if the cows will eat more feed would be another logical recommendation. Usually, if we add this water, there is less sorting because the feed kind of hangs together. Some people use liquid molasses. That can work equally effective as well. However, we must be aware that sometimes adding this amount of water in the summer dilutes out the pH or the acid levels in the feed, and that ration becomes less stable and will start to heat up quicker. Keep an eye on that in the summer period. Now let's take a quick look at some work on heat stress, referring back to these dry matter drops. Notice over here we have three different temperatures on the left side. If we go across the top line at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, thermal neutrality, these cows are eating at 100%. We then would assume they're going to eat, they will need about 40 pounds of dry matter intake. They will eat 40 pounds of dry matter intake. They will produce about 60 pounds of milk and consume about 18 gallons of water. Now let's bring the temperature up. We now go up to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. First thing that happens, maintenance requirement goes up. The cow has to take some nutrients and expend that to cool herself out there under heat stress conditions. To meet that extra nutrient need, she now has to eat two more pounds of dry matter. But if you go to the next line, there's the bad news. She eats about three pounds less. So we're burning both ends of the candle. Bottom line, 51 pounds of milk. 
Now let's go to a hot St. Louis muggy day, and the Cardinals aren't playing baseball. Now we can see maintenance goes up 20%. Cows eat, again, uh, similar amounts of dry matter or needs another pound of dry matter, but now they only eat 36 pounds. And that number could actually be worse, could be 34 or 33. Now we can see milk production down to 40 pounds. And there's that magic 20 pounds again. So again, heat stress, we get a double whammy. Maintenance goes up and the cow eats less. Bottom line, we get less milk. Cows don't breed and some cows get in metabolic problems. Other dry matter factors to consider is that how much wet feed can a cow eat? Our guidelines, 110 to 120 pounds is a pretty good target. So when you're running your computer software program, and you start seeing rations up at 130 pounds, and it's not pasture-driven, be careful. Remember, pasture will not limit dry matter intake because of the water is contained in the cell of the plant and is not fermented. Lame cows can reduce dry matter intake by 6 to 8 pounds for a score 4 or 5 cow. This is a very sore-footed cow, a limping cow. The largest meal will occur after each milking. That's why some people go to 3 or 4 time milking because they get an extra impetus to eat more feed. Roughly 15 to 20 percent of the total meals will occur after each, after each milking, based on some Michigan data. In a TMR system, typically 10 to 12 meals are consumed per cow per day, again with the biggest ones coming immediately after milking. Therefore, we need good bunk management to encourage these cows to have fresh, palatable feed two, four, six, eight hours later. Finally, our guideline for waybacks, this is feeds the cow does not consume over a 24-hour period is 2 to 4% of the total ration dry matter intake, and it should not be sorted. In other words, if I use my Penn State box and shake out the way back, it should have the same physical characteristics as the original TMR that went in the bunk. So let's summarize this module. How can I optimize or maximize dry matter intake? 1. A solid transition cow to avoid metabolic disorder. Quality forages. Having a calculated net energy value of over 0.6 mcals. That's why corn silage wins. Optimal fibers, ADF 19 to 20 percent. Uh, if we use NDF, somewhere around 28 to 32 percent NDF. Adequate non-fiber carbohydrates. This is your sugars and starches and pectins, 34 to 38 percent. Starch content, 25 to 27 percent, depending on the form of that starch and the fermentability of that starch. If we're feeding total mixed rations, try to feed two or three times a day, especially in the summertime when we have to maintain bunk life and palatability. And finally, avoid extremely wet rations. We define that as over 55% moisture. Well, that concludes this module on dry matter intake. Thanks and have a good day.